Miller College of Management, there's an artificial intelligence lab. I'm joined by the director, Dr. Sin Chin Chen, and PhD student Sagar Samtani. Thank you so much for being here. First, let's talk about this artificial intelligence lab. Dr. Chen, how did you come up with this? Uh, my advisor, he came from the CMU Carnegie Mellon University's Brain of Artificial Intelligence Lab, which is one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence. Uh, Dr. Herbert Simon. So ever since I graduated with a concentration artificial intelligence lab, came here in 1989, this lab has been branded as artificial intelligence lab. In, I think it's the only one in the College of Business. Okay. Yes. And what is it that, that students are, are, are learning or researching? And these days, AI has become very critical with machine learning, deep learning, you have heard about AlphaGo and so on. But in the simplest form, you're trying to teach computer to do things that human are good at, like playing Go, playing chess, and so on. So it requires understanding human problem solving, human intelligence, and teaching your computer to emulate that process, to emulate that intelligence. Mm -hmm. So that requires a lot of math, requires a lot of data mining, uh, re requires a lot of algorithm development, and that, uh, that you need to inject in your undergraduate and graduate curriculum. Uh, part yes. of that is the AZ Secure program, and Sagar, you're a student, a PhD student. What is it about the program that interested you? The emphasis on cybersecurity and, and the growing emphasis in society today on how people need to be more uh, aware of their cybersecurity concerns, um, and also the uh, the approaches that Dr. Chen is taking in the artificial intelligence lab, as far as using artificial intelligence approaches in cyber in a cybersecurity context, is something that's really truly unique uh, and not only that but also looking at specific types of data that other security uh, security researchers aren't really looking at all that much. So you're trying to outsmart the hackers? Yeah, I, I think we have the potential to do something good by understanding the uh, intent, their motivation, their ecosystem. In the past in the security space over the past almost 10 years has been very reactive. You're protecting yourself. You try to block the bullets that are shooting at, at you. But in our research, we try to understand the shooters behind the bullet. And the hackers are the people who create a bullet, create a weapon shooting at you. So this program, this, uh, the SFS program, uh, Scholarship for Service, and uh, another related research program called Hacker Web, we try to understand the web of hackers. Where they reside, what do they create, what kind of malware do they create, what kind of data did they steal from you? And what are the new emerging threats? So it's a very exciting program. Sagar, what can they learn from us or what can they take from us? They can take a lot of uh, personal, personal, personal related information. So a lot of our research, what we find is that a lot of the social security numbers or personal identification numbers are, are found in these hacker forums or these hacker communities where they just trade and sell that information with each other. And that typically happens after they've already breached or attacked us. Is most of that happening through our cell phones or our computers or where? Uh, I think definitely these days the mobile devices will create different avenue for them to steal your data. But even when you go to use an ATM machine, when, even when you go to uh, Target, swipe your credit card, there are some malware of viruses that are embedded and they're collecting not tens, twenty records. They are collecting hundreds of thousands of records per day from the different merchants, from your cell phone, from other online shops. So when there's a data breach, this is typically not in the order of thousands. These are tens of millions, hundreds of millions of records. And this has been becoming a daily occurring event over the past two or three years. And it's not going to stop any day soon. So the program is, is really trying to understand where they're getting this information, how they're getting it, and what they intend to do with it. Is that correct? Yeah, it's trying to understand the entire ecosystem, uh, also the exact people behind it, what their motivations are, and what their tools are, what they're, what they're using, et cetera. And so the program teaches students like Sagar here, who um, the, the program is funded by, by grants. Yeah, the program has been funded by two or three National Science Foundation grant. Uh, there are 12 of them in a research area, and there are one in scholarship that the Sagar would graduate and become a, a government employee. But during the training process, they will be learning vulnerability testing, they will be learning risk management. At the same time, they learn a lot of cutting edge tools that allow them to be one, two, ten steps ahead of the hackers. So we collect their data, we do linguistic analysis of the Russian sentiments. 
It's a Russian sharing information about stolen credit cards, about malware, and then we have another program looking at the Chinese mobile payment. Again, there are a lot of vulnerabilities and so on. So you're not just dealing English. English, you're dealing with many different languages, Russian, Chinese, and Farsi, and Arabic, and so on. And you need to understand their mentality. You need to understand the kind of modus operandi of each group. It's a big ecosystem. They are working as a, as a group in different specialty areas from the coding community for the Russians to the mobile or even cyber for warfare for the Chinese mm -hmm. to the hack hacktivists for the, for the Iranians and, and the Turkish uh, groups and so on. So it's a very divided, very international, but also very tightly coupled group in the underground economy. Sagar, what, is, what drives uh, these hackers? What is their motivation for doing this? It depends on the type of group that you're looking at. So Dr. Chen mentioned a few of the groups. So for example, the hacktivists, they're motivated by activists, you know, uh, activist campaigns, things of that nature. Some of them do it for financial gain. Uh, some of them do it for cyber warfare purposes. So it really depends on the particular demographic that you're looking at and what their particular motivations are. And he, Dr. Chen mentioned that you will eventually go work for, govern, for the government or a security agency. That's the goal, to get these students jobs? Yeah, for the SFS program, currently we had graduated four students. We still have 13 residents in the program now. We have funding for about $4.5 million to train 40 students. They will be serving for, most of them will be serving for the three letter agencies in the federal government, protecting the government infrastructures and so on. After they finish serving for the government for the equivalent number of years in their scholarship funding, master's student two years, PhD student three years, then they can go to industry, they can go to Google and Facebook, protect infrastructure, other, other industries and companies as well. Is that the goal for you? I mean, this is what you, you hope to do. Right. I mean, one of the one of the motivating factors for me to get into the program was the opportunity to serve the country in a cybersecurity position, um, and you know, academia is one way to go about doing this too. So it's not just limited to the the government sector, but also uh, becoming a professor in cybersecurity and things like that. So my training as a as part of the PhD program is training me more towards academia and becoming a professor. But I can use the skills that I've learned from the AZ Secure program to make a really novel contribution as far as cybersecurity is concerned in academia. How many students are currently enrolled? In, uh, you, can, you probably have students coming from all over the country who want to participate. Uh, for the SFS program, it has to be U.S. Uh, citizen okay. or residents, green card holder. And so we have a lot of interest from not just local Arizona students, but also from uh, all over the country. So, and, but over the past two years, we have been very careful in selecting our students because the government has a very stringent acceptance and then success rate. In this program, the success rate is 94%. Wow. So which means 100 students, you probably only lose five. So the success rate is very high, it's very selective. This program is also called Cyber Corp, like Peace Corp, and this is Cyber Corp. He mm -hmm. has been called the West Point for cybersecurity training. Just because it's that prestigious, we give the student $80,000 per year, even higher than a typical stipend at the University of Arizona PhD program. Don't tell the graduate students, but this program is higher. So almost $80,000 for two years, that's one dollars $60,000. Then government give you uh, training, security clearance, pay you uh, prevailing rate in the government uh, setting, typically in Washington, D.C. area, and also in other, other cities as well. Then with two years of training with a graduate degree, two years of hands-on experience, and many of them will get a security or top secret clearance, four years of very complete training, then you the sky is the limit, you can continue to stay in the agency. I think the 50% at least still continue to stay in the government. Mm -hmm. The other 50% may decide to move into other e-commerce space or go into PwC consulting firm and so on. And, they are, and probably their salary will jump easily by another 50%, 100%. Yeah. Uh -huh. so. It's well funded because this is important work. It is, it is. What, what, what motivates you to do this? You said earlier to, to serve the country. I mean, because we're, we're vulnerable. Right. Societal impact, uh, you know, the, the area of work that we're in right now has a lot of potential for societal impact. Uh, and some of, the, some of the research avenues that we are looking at could potentially curb cybercrime moving forward. So that's, that's a very big motivation to pursue this line of research. Do you think most people understand how vulnerable we are? 
Kind of, <laughs> kind of, yeah. Uh, it, it depends. I mean, uh, there are certain technical measures that are, that are put in place that people are not aware of whatsoever. So installing certain pieces of software on your phone that you think are benign, but they're really monitoring you and collecting your data, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of people who are, you know, very proactive about antivirus and password protection and things like that, but they are not aware of the technical implementations. Dr. Chen, what are some simple things that we can do as private citizens to, to really monitor and, and mm -hmm. secure our own safety? I think these days, the mobile devices pose the most threats. The mobile devices from cell phones to iPad and whatnot, especially when you are accessing uh, seemingly benign websites, free services and so on. So you have to carefully, really, I think these days, more so than three or four years ago, carefully look at the privacy setting, the opt-in or opt-out mechanism that makes sure that you're under the most secure mechanism. In the past, you don't think about that. But these days, a lot of data that are collected by, um, by the application, it could be a Facebook app and LinkedIn, and they're typically more better protected. But when you're connected to other free websites, and dictionaries and free services and so on, they inject cookies on your, on your browser, on your phone, such that they can collect your IP address, the time, the, the keywords that you're using. But if it's just collected by individual vendor, that's not a problem. But these days, they are sharing information. They become data vendor. You probably have to ask yourself, how do they make money from a free service? They make money from selling your data, your activity to other vendors. When they are sharing across all the industry, that becomes a very scary scenario that a lot of people outside know a lot about you, and then they can use the data to triangulate with your credit card information, your voting records, and so on. That poses a very strong security concern and privacy concern for everyone. So technology is really sort of fostering the, these, these hackers. Exactly, yes. So the past two or three years, you see the perfect storm forming, meaning that they have more information out there, more mobile devices, and perfect storm also meaning that the hacker community are become more powerful, more intent in stealing information and making a game uh, for their personal or financial benefits and so on. So this is the time that you really have to pay attention to privacy and cybersecurity.